Welcome to Beyond Barriers. Um, my name is Acacia Dietz, and I am hosting today with my co-host, Jeff Scoop. And today we have a very special guest with us. Mr. Rabbi Cooper of the Simon Wiesenthal Center is joining us today. Hi, Rabbi Cooper, and thanks for joining us with Beyond Barriers. Hi, Acacia and Jeff. Nice to see you both. You. Thanks for having me on your program. Definitely. Well, thanks for joining us. So, um, really excited to have you on the program, Rabbi Cooper. And it's it's nice to be able to see you in, in real life without uh, masks on like a few weeks ago. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so here we're using technology to have uh, put a human face on on the other. It's, uh, it's been a weird year for everybody. For sure. I, I wanted to, um, we wanted to ask you a little bit about, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about the Simon Wiesenthal Center and uh, your role specifically at the center. Right. So Simon Wiesenthal, a blessed memory, was uh, one of the Jewish victims uh, caught up in the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. Um, he uh, was born in Eastern Europe, married his childhood sweetheart, uh, experienced anti-Semitism on campus when he was in college. Uh, it was difficult for Jews to get in, especially in Eastern Europe, to even get into universities, a lot of discrimination. Um, and uh, trained as an architect. And his life, uh, you know, was destroyed along with millions of others when World War II uh, began uh, in 19... Uh, 45, May 1945, he was freed from the house in concentration camp in Austria. Uh, at the time, he was 50 pounds, was too weak to stand to thank the American soldiers who, uh, who, who saved him. Uh, but he started his Nazi hunting work almost immediately, giving and gathering information to uh, U.S. Uh, military, uh, and later on, you know, devoted the rest of his life to bringing uh, the people who perpetrated uh, history's greatest crime before the bar of justice. He wasn't trained as a lawyer, um, but he became a kind of uh, unofficial, if you will, uh, ambassador to six million ghosts. And it was very personal, not only because he b barely survived, uh, his wife was hidden by, by righteous Christians, but between them, they lost 89 members of their family. And so um, back in 1977, my, my mentor uh, and uh, I guess my senior partner, uh, Rabbi Marvin Heyer, uh, I came with him to Los Angeles to start the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And when Rabbi Heyer went to Vienna, Austria, where Mr. Wiesenthal set up his uh, uh, activity, his actions, he said, you know, I came here to take your most prized possession, your good name. And he said, well, not so fast. What are you going to use it for? If it'll be a place where people will only come to, to chant a memorial prayer, I'll give you a letter of support. But if you want my name, I'm an activist. And so I would expect that if you have a center bearing my name, you are also going to be activists. I know you're going to help me in the issues of Nazi war crimes, but there are also other issues. There are also additional victims, et cetera. So if you're ready to make that kind of commitment, you can have my name. So Rabbi Heyer, back in, uh, we came down from Canada, July 4th, uh, we left Vancouver, Canada, came to Los Angeles. And uh, here we are nearly uh, 44 years later. Uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center has really, I think, lived up to it. The original promise uh, and then some, but one of the things that he said back then was, I'm not only worried about old Nazis, I'm worried about the new ones. And he said, as a student activist myself, in, uh, back in, in Europe, our first reaction to uh, this uh, guy with a funny mustache by name of Hitler were Jewish jokes. And then when we woke up, it was too late. So that's sort of our approach uh, to issues is to, you know, try to see what's going on in the cutting edge, uh, try to identify to the best of our abilities, what the threats are, what the trends are. Uh, and, and, and as important, maybe more importantly, is to build out coalitions of, of people. Because, uh, of course, the Jews 
are often the first targets and victims, we've never been the last. And that would sort of also account for, for example, for the last 20 years, my involvement on behalf of uh, North Korean human rights. They use gas chambers there to fine tune the poison gas that they export to Syria and other places. They use live guinea pigs of political prisoners. And so if you have the name Simon Wiesenthal and there's someone out there doing things like that, you know, you have to speak up. Uh, I think the other area, just in terms of issues, I'll, I'll talk about the center in a minute, um, uh, also is that we have a very strong commitment to protecting the rights of uh, religious freedom for minorities all over the world. And right now, the number one targeted religious minority globally are Christians. So you, occasionally you're gonna see or hear from one of the rabbis talking about, we have to speak out, you have co-authored a book now, what's going on in Nigeria, the Coptic Christians in, in, uh, in Egypt, what happened in, uh, in uh, Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. A very simple approach. People should be able to go with their families on a Friday a Saturday or a Sunday, go to their house of worship, pray in peace, come home, and not have to worry about being bullied, insulted, violated, or God forbid, worse. So that that's a real sort of brief uh, uh, approach on, on a worldview. Of course, we're also home, our main educational arm is the Museum of Tolerance. Uh, we've had about well, well over 7 million visitors who've come through. We have uh, training for law enforcement, uh, which of course everyone today is talking about. We need to train police more. We're locked down like everyone else because of COVID, but these issues um, are very important. And I think also for the viewers, maybe hearing about us for the first time, we've been around a long time. We never endorse any candidates. It's not our job. We don't see the issues as Republican or Democratic or conservative or libertarian or liberal or progressive. We think the fundamentals in approaching life in a democracy are, are pretty basic. You know, critical thinking, uh, taking personal responsibility for your actions. And then, you know, onto that is the fact that we learned the hard way that words have consequence. So that means no matter how small or apparently irrelevant it might be, when people speak in this kind of hateful way, we pay a great deal of attention. And so one of the key uh, areas that we're involved with uh, every day now for a quarter of a century is what's going on in the computerized world, what's going on in the internet, uh, social media issues. We're very, very involved on the cutting edge of those uh, areas. Parler, for example, is one of the latest uh, sort of the uh, uh, anti-Twitter Twitter. And, you know, I wish them great success because uh, like many other people, I think Twitter went simply went off the rails, becoming, you know, political arbiters of what we should see or, or think. But we've been in touch with Parler because we have the experience that every single one of the social platforms uh, folks who are involved in promoting hate or terrorism or violence, whatever is free, whatever is accessible, whatever allows them to market, let's say to young people or to attack the people they don't like, they're there. So right now, although Parler is, I think, over 8 million and, and zooming along, um, we've had direct contact and talks with them because we're trying to encourage them to avoid the same exact pitfalls that every other company that we've dealt with. Uh, my first meeting at Facebook was when I had one building. Now they own, I think, four zip codes. So uh, we're, we're very much committed to the, uh, our democracy. I think America is the greatest country in, in the world. Um, and you know, we think also there are laws, they should be followed uh, and um, uh, we think that in any democracy, the best way forward is to try to find a middle ground and build out from it on key issues. Meaning it's not a, our concern or a Republican, Democrat, whatever, that's, that's your business. But in terms of the ties that bind us, 
you know, as a people and as a society, that's everyone's responsibility. So right now we're on a very small slither of, <laughs> of ground because bipartisanship and working together has not exactly been promoted in our political discourse over the last 15, 20 years. And we're, we're all suffering, uh, the, you know, the results of that. So, uh, you know, I've been very blessed to be in an amazing institution where um, we feel both the responsibility to, you know, to act, but also the fact that we're Americans, that we still have the rights to express ourselves, even if that means coming out against someone very powerful or some powerful people or movements. And that's that's uh, thank you so much for that overview. I mean, the, the work of the Wiesenthal Center is is absolutely incredible. And um, all the different things you guys are involved in one as a former extremist, when I first left the movement, you guys were amongst the first people that reached out to me. Um, in fact, when Rick found out that I was out, he was on a plane out here within a few days. And um, and I, I've had a phenomenal relationship with the organization since then. Um, what I didn't know, uh, looking from the outside in, we didn't have any idea that the Wiesenthal Center um, spoke up on behalf of Christians and all these other um, individuals. We assumed, and that's why I was really curious, you know, I already know, but I wanted our listeners to hear about the Wiesenthal Center and all the different things you guys are involved in. Um, I know, uh, well, you already covered a lot of that, but I mean, it, that's incredible. And I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding and there's a lot of people that don't really realize how many different things you guys are involved in and, and how many incredible different things. I think a lot of people, when they think about it, they think, well, that's just a Jewish organization. Um, of course, it's a Jewish organization, but um, it's involved in all these different human rights issues, which are so incredibly important. So I'm, I'm really glad you guys uh, are you're, you're working on all those things and that you covered that, because I think that that will set to rest a lot of misconceptions that people out there have that um, which leads me into my next question for you, too, is um, your approach. Um, I've got a few good questions for you, but this one, uh, the approach that the Wiesenthal Center has to extremism and then to former extremists as well. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about that, I, I think our listeners would like to hear that. Well, um, maybe let's talk, let's try to, if we can sort of personalize these things a little bit more. Sure. Um, you know, I've been with the Wiesenthal this 44th year. I can count on uh, the fingers of two hands. Uh, formers, real form, me, meaning people who had a real presence uh, and, uh, you know, made their exit uh, uh, public and then did themselves to try to write the ship, A for the house and more broadly. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, from the get go on with you, an incident that took place. I think you you know him quite well. T.J. Lydon was probably one of the first uh, of a generation ago who uh, became uh, an extremist, actually, when he was in the U.S. military. Unfortunately, when he was stationed in Hawaii. Long story. Eventually, you know, he was married with kids, and he had that epiphany one day and said, uh, no, no, I, I, this is wrong. I see where my kids are heading. My friends are either in jail, in a wheelchair, or dead. And that's not what I want, you know, for my for my family. One one particular program that I was with TJ, and he was a great great communicator as you are. So he he did his presentation. He told his story, and I'll never forget a young African American teen got up at the end and said, "You know, this is all fine and very nice that you no longer, but you yourself described how you used to lace up the jack boots." and go out with your friends and target b blacks in, in order to beat them into unconsciousness. What are you doing to make it up to them? And it was a very special moment, I think, for everybody, but especially, especially for TJ. That's sort of like the bottom line question. Uh, it's an intensely personal one, but it also means that you know, the members of the communities that you hated, they're sort of waiting for that answer from that kind uh, of person. Not everyone's a, 
a leader to begin with. But if you're a leader, you know the question's coming. And I thought his response was quite telling. He said, you know what? I, I think about that every day. I pray on it every day. Uh, I don't really have an answer because I can't find these. I don't know even know who these people are. It will be with me for the rest of my life. But I've committed to try to do my share to create an environment where this is not going to happen again. I found that his answer was honest, but it it also sort of establishes the boundary about you know when you say starting with a a, a clean slate. Yeah, we all believe in that. It's extremely important to try to do that. But um, for some people, it's just saying that was someone else yesterday and today I'm different. We actually, in our traditions, believe that's actually possible. But to get to that space, we call it a balchuva, somebody who's repented and is ready to move on. There's a whole checklist. And there are some things that we can do that, unfortunately, we have to leave to the good Lord to straighten out. But um, the possibility of change, uh, our, our tradition, we don't have saints. So we don't believe that they're any perfect specimen. Uh, you just have to read the first book of the Bible of Exodus, the first family that ever came around. They screwed things up when it was one family. So uh, there's a message there. The message is that, yeah, we're, we've got tremendous gifts that given to us, bestowed upon us as human beings. Many of us, I do, believe that each of us has that spark of the divine in, within. But it also means that we have the freedom of choice to completely screw it up and do terrible things or build on that spark and do a, a great thing. And so the notion that you can pick yourself up you can try to make amends. Uh, you you can move on and take the skill set that you you apply the you know for the wrong purposes. You can then take that same skill set and and do positive things. You're on the right path. So let's put it this way: we when we talk talk about the museum of tolerance that we have, right? We have zero tolerance for evil, and there are times when we talk about evil in the world. You can't talk down all evil from the tree with nice words. You know, Hitler, Mao, Stalin, uh, some people say this guy now running China, Xi. You, the, you, you sometimes just talking a good game isn't good enough. You have to know when to act. Okay, so in that sense, I, I'm, I'm not a pacifist. And I'm not very much into Kumbaya. You know, I was born and bred in the streets of New York City. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm kind of, we're, I think we're very much realists. But I, I think also a, a, a simple story, and maybe you, you've heard, but now uh, I've heard it from uh, when I was growing up, was a story, uh, especially in Europe, and I think I have it even on the Mississippi River, some of places where you have these um, rafts that take you from one side of a broad river to the other. Today we have, uh, uh, you know, you, you have uh, big ships that do it with cars. But whether it's a small raft or a big ship, the story goes that uh, a couple of people bought tickets to get across this. It was about a five mile wide spot across the river in, in Europe, Eastern Europe. And they go out and after about 20 minutes, a guy takes out a hand tool and he starts boring a hole underneath his seat. Well, the people sitting next to him go crazy and say, what are you doing? What's, what do you mean? I, here's my ticket. I have the same rights that you do on this ship. And I, you know, I would uh, like to bore a hole and uh, you know, see if the water is clean. So of course, what the, the message is quite clear. We can't choose who's going to be sitting next to us on an airplane, a subway, who's going to cut us off on a roadway, who's going to be in a classroom or working with us in a factory. We're all in the same ship together. So if you see someone who's about to bore a hole, either below them or, God forbid, coming at you, 
we have a responsibility, you know, to, to stop it. But the ultimate goal, if we can, is to sort of build out coalitions of people. And the, the, the method and, and the goal here is not to make cookie cutter answers. So everybody learns when they're in the third grade, you want to get an A on the test, this is what you check off. You know, probably more important uh, that knowing that it's Martin Luther King's birthday, the third Monday in, uh, in January, is for a kid to go and research and say, so what do I learn from Martin Luther King Jr.? You know, what, what is, how is it relevant, you know, to myself or whatever great American, you know, hero we're talking about? So if we, re if we either eliminate values from our public square, or it's just reduced to a multiple choice question so you can get a grade. So we're, we're heading in the wrong direction. Our view is we all have these uh, you know, conflicting um, uh, elements in our uh, personalities and our souls. And it's a matter about how we deal with it, who we, who we uh, uh, you know, choose to, to work with and how especially you treat the stranger, you treat the other. That's also a fundamental in, in the five books of Moses, it keeps talking over and over again, probably close to 40 times. Don't do this to someone else who's the stranger because you were once a stranger in Egypt. So if I, I very easily go from my Judaic roots to my democratic roots as, as a taxpayer and an American citizen. I have also one other advantage, I think for a lot of the people who are uh, you know, listening in is that it didn't start that way. I went on, first time I went on a plane, I was 18 years old uh, going to school in the Holy Land. I lived in New York. I wasn't even sure, I mean, it was like New York, I never, I was a baseball fan, but other than that, as far as I knew, the world began and ended in the five boroughs of New York City, like any typical New Yorker. But since then, I've probably traveled about say, seven or eight million miles. I've been to Japan 40 times. I go to Asia a great deal. You know, I just uh, was in Nigeria and, and wrote a book about endangered Christians uh, there. Uh, I'm very blessed because I've been able to meet you know, people of so many different cultures, backgrounds, and religion. And it's easy to say, well, I'm sure there are good people everywhere. I can report to you, there are good people everywhere and there are evildoers everywhere. Racism knows no color. There are places in, in Africa where if you're a white guy, you're in the minority and you know, you have to hope you're in a good, strong democracy. So. You can be a racist, you can be an anti-racist, doesn't make a difference what color your, your skin is. But the other most important lesson about all of those travels, which included before you guys were born, was known as the Soviet Union, communist Russia. What an absolute disaster. And from that time in 1972, when I came home, that's the, from that experience, I began to understand the amazing gift that I had in my life, that I was born as an American, because I can report to you 50 countries later, there isn't any place in the world that comes anywhere near the United States. But as Simon Wiesenthal himself warned, and it's in our museum, the great quote said, freedom is not a gift from heaven, it has to be fought for and earned every day. So it's a combination of ingredients. There would, we would not have a museum of tolerance in, uh, you know, in a place like uh, you know, North Korea or China or other societies where the government tells you how to think and the government tells you how to act and you better listen or else. You know, he said another great thing, where democracy is strong, it's good for Jews, and where it's weak, it's bad for Jews. So that, I think, a little bit more of a, a, a contextualization. So how do you fight extremism? You try to get the broadest relevant um, uh, alliance going. 
So sometimes it's a global thing, you go out. Sometimes you have to take a leadership role. So it's quite amazing. And Rabbi Heyer said, I was there twice. We met with the current Pope already twice. Uh, and both times, you know, you, the way it works when you're with a Pope, you have a private audience with your group. So you speak for three minutes, then the Pope speaks for three minutes. And at this time, there might be some, some inter, inter uh, so you get three minutes and we got anti-Semitism raging on both sides of the Atlantic. I'm sure that the Pope expected the Rabbi Heyer would talk about only about that issue. That's after all, we're Jews and this is a deep concern to us and he's a great religious figure. But halfway through his presentation, Rabbi Heyer talked about endangered Christian communities. And we do so as Jews. We're not, you know, you're not looking at a candidate for someone who's going to convert to Christianity. But it's real simple as an American because we were bestowed with this amazing, with these rights and these safeguards. So the way we look at the world is if a Coptic Christian is going to be blown to bits on Christmas Eve when he goes to Mass in Cairo, that makes every churchgoer around the world less safe. Every, uh, every Jew who, in, and unfortunately, every synagogue in Europe and most synagogues in the Americas, you can't get in without passing a guard or, you know, uh, 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 that's the way our uh, world is today. But, you know, that's the basic approach about extremism is you need to build coalitions. It's not only about you. In the area of uh, the, the front line today of extremism, when everything else that's marketed in our world is social media. So everyone is there, the good, bad, and the ugly. We're all there because it's the most powerful uh, marketing tool ever created. So the way we try to approach the, these very complicated issues in terms of the social media companies is that we believe that the consortium approach is the only way to go, meaning the companies themselves have the obligation, the capabilities of setting their own rules, being transparent about those rules, living up to those rules. And that means that when activists like yourselves or NGOs, civil society, other groups like us, or just a consumer or a teenager sends in and says, hey, what is this doing on what this stuff crosses the line, the line that you set, not a government. Why is it still up there? So we need those elements at the table and we need governments at the table too, because as you can see, the only time there's gonna be real change is when they're worried about you know, regulation or uh, 230 or, or whatever it, it may be. The goal, however, for us is very clear. We want to degrade the marketing capabilities of people who are promoting hate. What that means is we all know that there is no way in the world we live today to, make, to ensure that an idea will never find its way onto the internet. Forget it. There are plenty of, you know, uh, of, of companies uh, that are more than happy, uh, you know, to uh, allow it, to promote it, etc. But the main goal should be what we do in real life. We can't, you can't legislate hate out of existence. What you can do is you can try working together with our neighbors is to try to marginalize those forces, try to push it back in the gutter where it belongs. And that's pretty much, I think, an achievable goal also on social media. And so we name names, you know, every March, around March 1st, we come up with an annual report called Digital Terrorism and Hate. And we have a report card on each of the companies. Some of them are well known. Everyone uses them. Some are lesser known. But as you know, the, some of the worst uh, crimes uh, against uh, religious pe people and, and institutions. Pittsburgh, the guy was actually on social media and said, I'm going to go do the deed. In New Zealand, 
he was broadcasting live. Facebook for three days ran over 1.5 million Facebook users were repeating that live stream. They took it off, you know, after 48 hours. That's just one social media. Uh, the a uh, year ago in Halle, Germany, a shooter came on Yom Kippur. That's the holiest Jewish day. And there were 55 or 60 or so people praying inside, among them a few dozen Americans. He couldn't figure out a way how to fire his rifle in a way that would bust down the door. If he succeeded, you would have had a carnage then. And he was wearing, embedded in his helmet, the same thing, that camera. So there are so many different elements uh, that we need to work together on to degrade those capabilities. So you might say, well, Rabbi, what do you mean? Live stream, how can, well, I'm sure you know, both of you have been in, uh, interviewed. There's no such thing as live television. There's mm -hmm. always a delay of a couple of seconds. And there's no reason that the captains of online industry couldn't do the same. And there have been, as you know, live uh, killings on Facebook. Uh, a cop was killed in France, you know, by a terrorist live. And in so the way I look at it is no one group, no one institution, no one company, no one government can possibly um, come up with a strategy that would bring about the marginalizing of these forces. If we don't work together, then we're just allowing those guys to make that hole under the seat, yep. their seat, and then we're all screwed. Agreed 100%. This is, this is why we wanted you on the program. You're just full of wisdom and, and so many uh, wise uh, observations and, and things that uh, you can't argue with you. It's just, it's just common sense. It's so it's so incredible. Um, another so when the show is over, I'm I'm going to give you my wife's email address. If you can convince <laughs> me of that, I would I would be really grateful for for such help. <laughs> Sounds good, okay. um, Rabbi. Another thing I wanted to uh, we wanted to ask you about, which it was really really incredible for us when we met you a, a couple of weeks back, um, was. Um, about redemption, and, and I believe, and I, I'm probably going to butcher the word wrong here, but teshuva, we, we talked about that at your office. And I think for us, that really, it, it, it was really amazing to, to hear that from you. And, and uh, it was really meaningful. And I think that's something that our listeners, anybody that's on the fence, that's thinking about leaving, and I'm working with, we're working with people all the time that are coming out, you know, they don't, they're not yeah. going to um come and speak out like what we do like like you said i mean there's just a handful of us in the entire country that are actually willing to do that but there is people that are leaving literally all the time um it just in the past week i've had four or five people that i knew from from the movement that are out or that are in the process of getting out just in the last week or so so i mean there's there's constantly a flow of people coming out and i think it's really important because a lot of us had these um when we when we were extremists and i'll, I'll just speak from my own uh, personal experience i felt like there was no way out that if i came out that i would be hunted down to the ends of the earth and and all this sort of thing as this nazi that i was in the past that it would never be um uh, it's it's a fear that a lot of people in the movement have that they'll always be seen that way that they can't change and and um you know we understand that i understand that the change is possible and 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 all of this sort of thing but i think there's a lot of people that fear that it's not possible so i i think that if you could share a little bit about that conversation about redemption or teshuva um with the listeners i, I think right. it would be really interesting um well, first, let, let me just say in this connection, a, another important lesson that I learned from Simon Wiesenthal. He was once asked, was he surprised how many Nazis there were in the world? And his answer was, not at all. But I was surprised and said in by how few anti-Nazis there were. So I don't want to overemphasize or dramatize 
the importance uh, to society of a person walking away from hate. I think that in, this, in, in some ways is self-evident. So I'm not gonna talk to that because I think what you asked is something much, much more personal uh, and you know, people struggling within themselves. So the, the prescription that our tradition gives about uh, repentance, which means coming back to our original source, right? Finding that divine spark. Um, the, what's extremely important in the process is not just to say, I was always a good person in my heart, and now I'm going to be a good person again. Yes, that'll be very nice for you to say to yourself, but as we say in the old country, you have to put meat on the bone. And that means that you have to, not necessarily again publicly, it's not to get up in the town square, but to the extent that you can um, go to individuals who you hurt and uh, find a way, whether it's personally or in a letter or any, whatever it might be, to own up to the deeds that were done in the past. That's the most difficult part of this entire process, but it's really critical because otherwise everything is just inside. You can ask yourself every day, well, did I really change? Have I done anything to prove to myself that I've changed? I think that is the biggest struggle and would be the biggest achievement of all is that when you're, you know, you're on the next, uh, the, the next level, looking back, you might someday say, I can't believe I did all those things. But you can only say that if you really have changed and you can only change if in some ways you find a way to uh, address the extent that you can, the terrible things that you've done and people may have been hurt by you. Again, I know that most people, and I get it, have no interest, and I don't think we're, any of us have an interest. We don't need a, you know, a, a chorus of people saying, yes, we've seen the light, and now, you know, etc. The, the heavy lifting is deeply and intensely personal. And the key to that is you have to own up to what you did and try to uh, address that. Once you do that, you know, you do in a many, in, in a sense, you are becoming a different person. You're becoming a new person. In many cases, you may be reconnecting to who you thought you were going to be or get to. Uh, and you may have, you know, some of the same uh, fears and concerns and frustrations about society. They don't go away the next day after you offload a certain approach. So you have to also now reconstruct and say, okay, what are my priorities? What can I change? And in a democracy, oh, and with social media, there, you know, there's a, there are amazing things that we are capable of doing. It doesn't have to happen all at once. And if it's a private, you know, personal struggle, et cetera, then, you know, that's, um, that's understandable. But the most important contribution, A, is the concept that we're not fated to follow a specific path. We can change and, it, and it's not uh, easy. And then the, the second point is that in order to prove to yourself that you have changed, it can't just be, I know now I'm a good person in my heart. That part from where I sit doesn't compute. And I would suggest um, a book, it's out, out of print, but you can get it online and at local library called The Sunflower based on a true story that happened to Simon Wiesenthal. It's a book he wrote about a real uh, incident in which well, he was uh, barely alive in one of the, uh, these uh, Nazi camps. And he was pulled out of line and brought to a field hospital not far from the camp, which was in the middle of a sunflower field. And he was brought inside the tent and there was an, an SS officer in a, in a, it was a mass unit and he was dying from his wounds. And he asked to see a Jew before he died. And he admits to Simon Wiesenthal, I killed Jew, I murdered Jews. And now I'm gonna go see my maker. Um, I want you to forgive me for my sins, what I did. You're a Jew, forgive me for the murders that I committed. 
the book, there are two different editions, an older one and one that was done probably about 10, 15 years ago. Before he tells you his re reaction, he went to spiritual leaders all over the world and asked them what your answer would be. Because there are many traditions of many faiths and the people who are not necessarily of faith who thought on the issue of repentance. So there's a whole long list. I'm just giving you my worldview, but the fact that this is a question about, this is an ex in the most extreme case, but the issue of the person seeking repentance and the victim, what are the responsibilities you know, from, from, the, from, the, two, from, the, from the two? And when it involves a capital crime, we have a totally different view. It involves a direct crime uh, or act that you did to hurt someone, you know, you, you have to make that amend. Uh, you have to try to make that connection. In, in effect, what you're trying to do is try, you, you're going back and trying to humanize people you de dehumanize. So, um, and it's a, it's a lifelong struggle for all of us. Uh, we're, we're constantly tripping and falling, etc. But, you know, it's not a free pass. Judaism doesn't believe on Oh, deathbed confession and a nice check to the clergyman and all this. Right. That, that's not who we are. And we've never been been that. But nonetheless, uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, I think God has bestowed this possibility on on humanity because, you know, he know, he once he gave us that uh, the possibility of freedom of choice, we're not robots. We're not controlled by uh, totalitarian uh, governments. Uh, we have, especially in America, freedom to think, freedom to act, do whatever we want, seemingly with no consequence. Uh, so that, that means we, we need, this, this is a lifeline, but the lifeline is not an automatic lifeline. You've got to grab it and you've got to climb all the way. Some people can help you with parts of that climb, and the most difficult parts are intensely personal. Incredible. Uh, Acacia, did you have, I have one more otherwise? Um, I actually, I think he actually, you actually covered everything that I was actually gonna ask. Um, yeah, really. I just, I thought it was really important about the uh, repentance and the fact that in the redemption, I mean, it is, like you said, it's deeply personal. I mean, there are certain things that you can do, but all in all, it is definitely a personal thing. I just think if, if someone, right, if someone tells you it's easy, uh, you know, I, uh, I just always go back to TJ Leiden's confrontation when he had already done almost everything he possibly could it was important from him to hear, in a sense, from a representative of the victims. Oh, wait a second, guy. You think you're all the way back, but you're not. Right. And that itself is part of the process. Yeah, it's it's definitely not it's definitely definitely not easy, but it's it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. I mean, it's like when you're when you're in a, a hate group or a movement like that, it's like you're carrying this weight on your back and it's and it's holding you down and, and it's it's smothering you literally, or it's, it's literally crippling you over and getting that, getting rid of that and doing positive, meaningful things in life, I, I think is just, is so incredible. That's, that's why I speak out and I, I do the work that we do with Beyond Barriers is to, is part of it is redemption. Part of it is trying to uh, right the wrongs of the past. And um, it also feels good. That's the plus, you know, it feels good to, to uh, help other people and all that. Um, so my last uh, question for you too is, as as um, you know, someone that's trying to break down barriers and, and help other people to to walk out of uh, things like uh, uh, extremism, whether it's a hate group, whether it's religious extremism, far left, far right, um, any of that. Um, I wanted to ask you about your interactions with the Muslim community because there's a lot of misconceptions where people feel like Jews and Muslims are are bitter enemies. And I know you've done a lot of incredible work with um, building bridges and getting people beyond the barriers in that uh, sense and um, uh, not necessarily natural allies, but um, 
you know, you've done some really groundbreaking work there and I, I would like yeah. to hear about it. Well, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, part of the fact of being born and bred in New York City, uh, I think most New Yorkers have what's called an extra little dash of chutzpah, which, which means we're, we're often going to jump into situations where you're going to say, like, what were you thinking? But seriously, you know, having the honor to work the Museum of Tolerance and the Simon Wiesenthal Center for decades, um, and we talk about draining swamps of hatred. Uh, I try to utilize that uh, opportunity to really go all over the world looking for what I call normals, not just among Muslims, uh, you know, among the Buddhists, the others in, in Japan and in different places. People have, but when you boil it down just to that basic thing about being a decent person, et cetera. Um, so that, those, uh, that road has taken me to Indonesia, the world's most populous uh, Muslim country. Wow. I think around 200 million Muslims. India is the second largest by population, even though it's not a, it's a, uh, it's a Hindu country, but has around 140 million Muslims. Uh, and um, of course, I've had the honor of doing some, let's just call it advanced work in the Gulf, in Bahrain, in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I went, uh, I've been numerous times to a country called Azerbaijan, next door to Iran. That's a 96% Muslim country that protects all religions, all the minorities. So that's sort of a litmus test for me. That's the kind of place I'm looking for those kinds of leaders. And so it's not so much interfaith, it's multi-faith. The other part of this is there are people, and I co-wrote a, a book uh, called uh, The Next Jihad, of what's going on now in Nigeria. There are terrorists and thugs and murderers who invoke the, the language of Islam uh, jihad, et cetera, et cetera. They, some will say they hijacked it. Others will say when they follow it, no, this is what, uh, what Allah meant. I'm not a Muslim theologian. I think that most Muslims understand there's a challenge that among them in this global religion are people who are using all of the trappings of that faith in order to legitimate uh, murder and worse, they're saying that God wants them to strap a little kid with uh, you know, a, a, a suicide vest, go into another mosque or a church or into a pizza shop in Jerusalem uh, and, and blow up you know, pregnant women or people with prayer. They actually think that that's what God sent us for uh, on this earth. That is a huge problem. It's a huge challenge to all. And the people who need to lead the counterattack on that are Muslims. The rest of us, where we want to see the change, but no rabbi, priest, gang member, nobody could dictate that change. That change has to come from within. And we're seeing in some, in some places significant uh, uh, changes, but there's a, a very long, uh, you know, a very long way to... Uh, uh, to go. And I just have a, a very simple approach to it. I'm ready to sit down with anyone who's ready to respect who I am. I don't expect everyone that I meet to say, oh, uh, Rabbi Cooper, you're a Zionist. Uh, you love your family. Uh, yeah, okay, now I'm a Zionist too. Uh, that's, you know, ridiculous. But I want people to respect who I am in all of its dimensions. If they're ready to show that respect, I'm ready to sit with them. And by the way, there are people today in the United States, you know, extremists who are saying, no, no, if you want to get in, let's say you, you want to be in the Women's March. No, we have a checklist. If you uh, love Israel, you can't, you can't play, don't bring your marbles or dolls with us. You can't be part of the team. So this is th this mentality. And I think this is maybe the last comment that I would make, because it's not about religion. It's really about human psychology leadership and belonging to a group. Anyone who tells you that the price of, of joining a group means that you have to sign on to a group think 
that you're not really comfortable with, that you don't really buy into, but you like the idea of wearing the same jacket, uniform, or whatever it is, and you're ready to sort of, you know, hold your nose and do it initially, but you do it often enough, you stop holding your nose. So exactly. that's, that is the psychology that has to be broken. And just to remember, you know, every single person is unique and has a unique contribution to make. And the amazing thing about us being Americans, it's really totally our choice. You can't blame it on anyone else. We live in a, in a free country, in a free society. In some other places that I go to, there's still a king. And if he gets up on the wrong side of the bed one morning and doesn't like the way your hair looks, <laughs> you're going to be in trouble. Right. So we're kind of spoiled Americans right across uh, uh, the bounds. But that also means with that unbelievable unfettered freedom comes on full responsibility for what we do. Absolutely. That was it in a nutshell. I love it. Yes, <laughs> thank you, thank so, you so much for well, joining us. Thank um, and you, Jeff and Acacia. And, and I hope, uh, you know, sometime in the next couple of months, let's hook up again. We can continue the dialogue. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you very and, much. And, and good luck with your work in, in with uh, on yourselves and in helping others to choose to do the right thing. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank it was you. an honor. God bless. All the best. Bye-bye. What Rabbi Cooper was talking about, like, is so true. Like he was talking about, you know, with great freedom comes great responsibility. And it really does. And it is a choice to not only just walk away from groups like this and from extremism and from hate and all of that, but it's also a continuous daily choice every day to keep making those decisions, to keep walking the correct path and doing it for the you know right reasons, but doing it because it's the right thing. And that's what we need to do. Did you have any thoughts on uh, Rabbi, what Rabbi Cooper shared today? It was really good. I think um, what people really need to take into consideration is, is a lot of the wisdom and, and thoughts that he had on, on, you know, doing the work. And when you, and you, when you get out, it's not just about saying, oh, I've changed. Everything's better now. No, it's, it's not that simple, you know, and, and uh, I, I really like the way he put that because it gives, it gives people an opportunity to think that sort of sort of thing over you know all of us that work towards change in our lives that it's a constant ongoing struggle it's something that we will constantly be working on it's constantly uh for the rest of our lives it's something that we need to um focus upon and and do better at and uh what i really enjoyed about the conversation too is is um in the last question i had um uh, for him it, and we covered it, we covered it a little bit, but uh, was the misconceptions is there's a lot of people that are, that are looking about, as you know, I mean, we work with a lot of the people that are coming out and that have left or, or that are on the fence about leaving. And there's all these misconceptions about how society won't allow them back or won't welcome them back and, and things like that. I, I think it's incredibly important I mean, for, for people like us to be sitting here talking with somebody like um, Rabbi Cooper and having friends at the Wiesenthal Center, Rick Eaton, Allison and, and the Midwest direct, Allison, the Midwest director, um, all these wonderful people uh, for, for us, we would have never expected that. Not at all. I, for sure. When they, when Rick first reached out to me, um, you know, when I was started speaking out, I, I was shocked. I, I was like, oh boy, I don't know. You know, I, I was a little nervous, even a lot nervous, a little nervous, right. a lot. I was a lot nervous, um, you know, because I hadn't really had that many interactions with Jewish people. And in the movement, a lot of people are, are very nervous about groups like the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And um, they just have these, these misconceptions about the faith, about the, about the organization, about Jewish people in general. And, and uh, I'm, I'm as guilty of it or more guilty of it than 
probably anybody else as far as vilifying these people. So it was um, incredibly meaningful for me personally to to have the relationship um, that I have today with all of the Jewish people that I know. And uh, it's just been incredible, um, it, incredibly thankful, thankful that they view the world um so many of them view the world in this way and can see that uh, people can change and um, it's, it's really meaningful. So I think, um, you know, to, to our listeners out there for them to know that, um, that I think is, is important. I think it's important that they realize you're, you know, the world is not always going to view you as this villain, you know, or if you change, if you truly change and there's a big difference. And I, and I really like how Rabbi Cooper put that too. You know, there's a difference between just saying something and, and actually doing it. Right. So anybody can say, Oh, I've changed and then not really change. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not meaningful. That's not right. It's not honorable. It's not noble. It's not proper, but if someone's truly trying to change and or someone has changed, these are things I think we as society, um, I know with the work at Beyond Barriers, we welcome that change. You know, we know it takes time uh, with a lot of the different people. We have people that we work with, as you know, that they change very quickly and they're very resilient and, 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 and that's, it's fast. For other people, it, some of the things that they struggle with takes years and years and years to be able to put some of that uh, behind them. And some people, you know, never let go of, of certain, certain things. But the important thing is, you know, for, for all of us, I think as humanity is to recognize, especially when someone is trying to, trying to change. I know with Beyond Barriers, that's one of the things we focus on.